commence. Okay. <clears throat> All right. I was saying our speaker shall return. He's here. He, okay. He's among us. And um, so I'm Bob Jow. Everybody knows that. Um, it's always great when I can say that to people who don't know who I might be and introduce myself to them. Um, and I am pleased to welcome Brandon Major here. Uh, Brandon earned an MFA in poetry from Rutgers University, Newark. He began his career at several universities in New Jersey, teaching traditional college courses as, as, courses as well as college level courses for high school students. He has been teaching creative writing and literature since 2008. Originally from New Jersey, a desire for fewer buildings and people compelled him to relocate to the Northeast Kingdom. That is true for me, perhaps some of you. Okay. How was it for you, the film? One, two, three. You know, usually I mumble, I always say this, I mumble and um, everybody else you'll hear is going to have a better, sorry about that. I'm trying not to be both joking and ineffective here. Mr. Major has spoken at the Athenaeum on Walt Whitman. Anybody hear him speak on Walt Whitman? This was about four years ago. It was a great talk. He said something very controversial. Someone asked, I think this is how it went, someone said, would Walt Whitman have joined the Civil War? And Brandon said, Walt Whitman was a coward. And it brought an immediate reaction, and it really livened up the q and <laughs> It was great. He has spoken as well on Larry Levis, and if you have not heard him, we have most of Larry Levis's books here because of Brandon, because this is a man I had never heard of um, and read his poetry on Brandon's recommendation because he was speaking on him. And he's one of these people who I have come to love and I'm amazed that I never heard of this man. He's also deceased. He has had increased popularity since his death. I don't know if that's related, but there have been a number of books published posthumously, and he is an amazing poet, so I learned a great deal. And now, Brandon is speaking on Emily Dickinson, so he has done Walt Whitman and the other, I consider, bookend poet of the 19th century, Emily Dickinson, and I know we will learn new things. Um, of Walt Whitman, he said he finds Whitman a fascinating and strange writer. I concur. He will now inform us of the other bookend poet, Emily Dickinson. Please welcome Brandon Major. take uh, responsibility for my own, you know, description there. I I'm glad that there's some corroborating evidence. I kind of made that sort of off the cuff and it sort of... Very much so. Yeah. Yeah, I need to think more before I speak. Because it, it got a lot of people fired up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was... Yeah, but that was like after an hour of me, you know, speaking and then people really got into it. So that was funny. Um, uh, okay, so uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank the Athenaeum for hosting the series, um, and more specifically Bob for his leadership. Um, you know, I think he's doing a lot of interesting things. I think this, this contemporary gallery up here is a great contrast to what we have downstairs, and I think it's going to bring a lot of people that the kingdom hasn't seen here to our eyes, and it's altogether a great thing that's going on at the Athenaeum. Um, and even more specifically, I want to thank Bob for his sort of uh, attitude and trustfulness and patience because the relationship we have is I sort of burst into his office once a year unannounced and say, I've got an idea. And he says, OK. And then I give him a very sort of tenuous, skeletal description of an idea. And he listens. And then he says, OK. And then I talk. Um, and that's how it, that's how it goes. Um, and also, you know, uh, we get a lot of Dartmouth professors and stuff in here, very credentialed people, but, you know, he lets me have a crack at it, and I appreciate that for sure. You know, because I'm just excited to talk about, you know, writers and books, and, you know, that's what we're here to do. So that concludes the, um, the heartfelt preamble. Um, on to the Emily Dickinson uh, talk. Um, so if I'm providing an overview, um, of critical opinions of Dickinson, um, I feel obligated to share with you excerpts from Sandra M. Gilbert and Susan Gubar's 1979 book, The Mad Woman in the Attic, The Woman Writer 
and the 19th century literary imagination, which its publisher, Yale University Press, calls a path-breaking book of feminist criticism and covers authors such as Jane Austen, Mary Shelley, Emily Bronte, George Eliot, and Emily Dickinson. Uh, the book offers readers the author's realization after comparing these female writers that the personal was the political, the sexual was the textual. Gilbert and Gubar include Dickinson in part four of their book, which is subheaded Strength in Agony, and variously employ the critical lenses of biography, psychology, and gender to weigh the difference between Emily Dickinson the person and Emily Dickinson the poetic voice. And that degree of difference is the topic that's been so debated in the years since Dickinson's writing by so many scholar critics. Gilbert and Gubar do write that almost all late 18th and 19th century women writers secreted bitter self-portraits of mad women in the attics of their novels. But Emily Dickinson herself became a mad woman, became, as we shall see, both ironically a mad woman, a deliberate impersonation of a mad woman, and truly a mad woman, a helpless agoraphobic trapped in a room in her father's house. Gilbert and Gubar write that Dickinson's life itself became a kind of novel or narrative poem in which through an extraordinary complex series of maneuvers, aided by costumes that came inevitably to hand, this inventive poet enacted and eventually resolved both her anxieties about her art and her anger at female subordination. The authors are quick to point out that critics have often, of course, defined Emily Dickinson as one of American literature's most expert posers. R.B. Sewell, for instance, asserts that the hyperbole and melodrama of what he calls the Dickinson family rhetoric played a crucial part in the wit, the whimsy, the turn for drama and exaggeration which characterizes so much of the poet's work. There's that biographical lens, and it seems almost as if Sewell is saying the tone and content of Dickinson's poems make them not these twisted, tortured pleas for help, but merely responses to, or continuations of, the Dickinson family's idiosyncratic rhetoric. Because remember, she never intended for the majority of her poems to be read by the public. Though Gilbert and Gubar summarize Sewell's theory, they don't subscribe to it because, according to them, most critics have not confronted either the nature or the magnitude or the problem Dickinson had to solve as a woman poet. They have misunderstood both the nature and the purpose of her posing. Biographical scholars have concentrated on the mystery of her lover slash master's identity or on the question of her religious commitment or both. Literary critics have addressed themselves to the linguistic and metaphysical ambiguities of her art. Almost all have concluded with Sewell that as poet, Dickinson worked from specific to general, concrete to universal. She became preoccupied with essence. The accidents did not concern her, and her posing, her turn for drama, according to almost all of these critics and scholars, was merely one of the accidents of Dickinson's life. What Gilbert and Gubar contribute to Dickinson's scholarship is the argument that Dickinson's posing was not an accident of, but essential to her poetic self-achievement, specifically because the verse drama into which she transformed her life enabled her to transcend what Susan Juhage has called the double bind of the woman poet. On the one hand, the impossibility of self-assertion for a woman on the other hand, the necessity of self-assertion for a poet. They insist, Gilbert and Gubar, they insist that for Dickinson, art is not so much poesis, making, as it is mimesis, enactment. And this because she believes that even consciousness is not so much reflective as it is theatrical. Life is enactment. Art, the outward manifestation of the scenes performed on an inner stage, and thus an actor and her characters are one. 
They are one supposed person, or rather a series of such persons, interacting in a romantic drama or a gigantic and incredible novel. Gilbert and Gubar choose to say novel in reference to Dickinson's poem, No Romance Sold Unto, which, there we go. No romance sold unto could so enthrall a man as the perusal of his individual one. Tis fictions to dilute to plausibility are novel. When tis small enough to credit, tisn't true. The principal characters in this lifelong drama novel in verse are opposing forces. Gilbert and Gubar write that certainly something like the relationship between a masterful husband and a self-abnegating wife appears to be at the heart of much of her poetry, where it is also pictured variously as the encounter of lover and mistress, king and queen. On closer examination, however, we can see that the male-female relationship is really that of father and daughter, master and scholar or slave, ferocious man of noon and vulnerable flower of dawn. And by the way, with the arrival of spring, is it fair to say that spring has arrived in the Northeast Kingdom? Is that fair? Thank you. As I was driving down here, the thought occurred to me that I should have, you know, uh, tossed this talk in the trash and rewritten a new one like last night about all of Dickinson's poems about like flowers and gardening and stuff but then I was like ah oh, but I did all this work you know so I might as well keep rolling with it okay um, they name Gilbert and Gubar they name just a few here but those of you in the audience who know Dickinson well know her use of a child's tone and know how she describes herself as a wren or a daisy or a mouse facing some larger force or person or even a few times as encountering death or God. But since we've just heard this poem, I'd like to bring in another voice here as a foil to Gilbert and Gubar's book, which I'll repeat was first published in 1979, and that's the voice of blogger Susan Kornfeld, who has undertaken the ambitious project of reading and commenting on all of Emily Dickinson's 1,789 poems in chronological order. And the more I thought about this, um, the more I realized that poems are an effective complement to a blog since they're easily digestible in a few minutes. Are a poet's hundreds or thousands of poems composed in their lifetime and a blogger's myriad posts that much different? Don't they both make up in totality a drama or novel told in shorter verses? Kornfeld's blog is called The Prowling Bee, after a Dickinson poem, and her view on Dickinson's work seems to depend upon or confirm Gilbert and Gubar's use of the term poesis, which means making, and mimesis, which they use as meaning enactment, but since it's a Greek word, can also be translated to serve the meanings of representation or mimicry. And Eric Arbach, the literary scholar, has this book uh, mimesis about representation in literature, and for him, the moment when, I think it's the maid in uh, the Odyssey, the maid recognizes the scar on Odysseus' leg and realizes that it's him in disguise. For Eric Orbach, that was this big moment, this revelatory moment for him in literary criticism, right? So it's all about mimesis, right? It's all about um, symbolism, right? If we place Gilbert, Gubar, and Kornfeld together, they work together to show us that Dickinson is musing on the use of art in our lives. Kornfeld writes that in this poem's first stanza, Dickinson makes the claim that we find our own life more interesting than those portrayed in any romance we could buy. By romance, she's probably referring to such books as those she read by Hawthorne, by Washington Irving, Sir Walter Scott, George Eliot. Uh, you could never be as enthralled in a book, she says, as in the contemplation of your own life. Certainly, many of us devote untold hours recounting the odd jigs and jags of our lives, snippets of conversations, musings about what might have been, and wonder at how we ended up where we are. At least I do. I don't know you do. Um, and yet, many of us would pick up a book for a happy afternoon far more quickly than embark on a real perusal of ourselves. Kornfeld continues, and her analysis of the poem's second stanza is that Dickinson claims that the novelistic process is dilution, not amplification. Jewelers cut through earthy or mineral matrix to isolate a crystal and then facet the resulting jewel to best display its fire. 
Likewise, the novelist chisels away at life to produce a polished, coherent, and plausible story. Dickinson's point is that much of that story is embedded in the rock and matrix in which it grew. The truth of the crystal is in the volcano, the gradual depositions of water, the tectonic foldings of earth, all of which has been severed from the jewel. The truth of life is tangled in the interplays of history, locality, society, and family. It often turns out as implausibly as the daughter of a straight-laced Calvinist lawyer becoming a reclusive and explosive poet. But Dickinson doesn't just say that much is lost in novelistic paring down and shaping. She says that when the novel is finally small enough to be believable, it isn't true. Something vital has been lost. What is left is a false presentation, a severed jewel. So none of her poems have titles, so we refer to them. But some of them are referenced by first line, and I'd like to see. No romance sold in two is the first line. Um, I don't know the numbering system. Aren't there two competing numbering systems for Dickinson poems? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I've always seen it referred to as no romance sold unto. Yeah. There's also different collections of her work, right? Some of which include some at the cost of, uh, you know, excluding others. Um, but I'm about to move on. If we choose another Dickinson poem and look at our critics' takes on it, we'll see them diverge. The poem is Papa Above. Papa Above, regard a mouse o'erpowered by the cat. Reserve within thy kingdom a mansion for the rat. Snug in seraphic cupboards to nibble all the day while unsuspecting cycles wheel solemnly away. To Kornfeld, this bit of whimsy addressing the most high as Papa pleads for the lowliest of creatures to find a haven in heaven. Jesus told his followers that his father's house had many mansions and the poet would like to make sure that there is at least a snug cupboard where the little mouse or rat might nibble all the day. It is likely that Dickinson is thinking of herself as just a bit of a mouse who wants just a bit of heaven, something safe and cozy. The iambic trimeter reinforces the fable quality of the poem. It's a nice little story. I can imagine it as a children's picture book. But to Gilbert and Gubar, this poem shows us Dickinson's association of her earthly papa with a heavenly papa like her own identification with a dead mouse and represents what she genuinely believed was the power ratio between her father and herself, or even between all fathers and all daughters. At the same time, however, her comically coy exaggeration of daddy and herself into a mouse suggests the artfulness with which she dramatized her problems so as to give extra intensity to the fiction she understood herself to be enacting. Her ironic hyperbole suggests, in addition, her lucid awareness of the literary and theological paradigms she might find for her relationship with her father. And finally, it suggests her consciousness of the extent to which she herself desired to destroy or subvert that relationship. As for the poem's ending, Kornfeld writes that the last two lines save it from saccharine simplicity. At the simplest level, they can just be read as meaning forever. But Dickinson has unexpectedly complicated the worldview here. The cycles, years or other calendar type units, are unsuspecting. The solar system, perhaps even the cosmos, is unaware of what happens in the afterlife. They wheel along grandly, a nice contrast to a nibbling little mouse. The irony is nice. The world is solemn while heaven is a darling little nook, at least for a mouse or rat or bashful poet. Gilbert and Gubar believe the ending's solemn but unsuspecting celestial cycles are curiously reminiscent, after all, of the six generations of earnest, God-fearing men who represented the Dickinson family every Sabbath in the old meeting house, and the snug poetic mouse is a tiny but subversive force in seraphic cupboards. Gilbert and Gubar say that there is a sense in which the color, or uncolor, white is the key 
to the whole metaphorical history of Emily Dickinson as a supposed person, which, and it's interesting, I mean, they say a supposed person. So let's take a look at the poem, A Solemn Thing It Was I Said. A solemn thing it was, I said, a woman white to be, and where, if God should count me fit, her blameless mystery, a hallowed thing to drop a life into the purple well, too plummetless that it return eternity until. I pondered how the bliss would look and would it feel as big when I could take it in my hand as hovering seen through fog. And then the size of this small life, the sages call it small, swelled like horizons in my vest and I sneered softly, small? Gilbert and Gubar write that sometime in the early or mid 1860s, Dickinson took to wearing her famous white dress, perhaps at first intermittently as a costume of special import for special occasions, then constantly, so that this extraordinary costume became an ordinary habit I'm presuming the authors use the word habit invoking both the meaning a regular practice and the religious garment since nuns withdraw from society to gain access to some spiritual purity. And according to Kornfeld, nuns prior to the end of the 1800s wore white, the color of purity. And Dickinson says here that she will wear the consecrated white. Kornfeld continues, noting that Whistler painted The White Girl a year before Dickinson wrote this poem, and the novel The Woman in White was serialized in 1859. Gilbert and Gubar write that Dickinson had long associated white with size, specifically with theatrical largesse. As early as 1859, she commented that although to fight aloud is very brave, it is gallanter to charge within the bosom the cavalry of woe, which parallels in this poem the small life which swelled like horizons in her vest. So there's a very Dickinsonian dichotomy set up there of the public male battle versus the private female one. And Dickinson tells us the angels go rank after rank with even feet and uniforms of snow. While this might seem to prove that Dickinson felt the white feminine purity is a spiritually just one, to stop at this reading would be to miss the fact that if Dickinson took to wearing white after this poem, then a solemn thing is a poetic self-definition and that white can represent many things and has to, to take into account all of her other poems. Gilbert and Gubar quickly remind us that we should wonder if Dickinson herself consciously intended her wardrobe to convey any one message. The range of association her white poems imply suggests, on the contrary, that for her, as for Melville, white is the ultimate symbol of enigma, paradox, and irony not so much a color as the visible absence of color, and at the same time the concrete of all colors. They follow this idea with a litany of possibilities. White could be the energy of romantic creativity, the loneliness or polar cold of the renunciation or tribulation romantic creativity may demand, both the white radiance of eternity or revelation, the white terror of a shroud, a two-edged blade of light associated with both flame and snow, both triumph and martyrdom, a divine intensity and a divine absence, the innocence of dawn and the iciness of death, the passion of the bride and the snow of the virgin, a blank page, an unlived life, the sheer fatigue of winter, the glory of heaven and the ghastliness of hell united in a single creative or destructive principle associated with babies and ghosts, the color of the lily's foot and the spider's thread, or the tender daisy's petals and the pearl's tough skin. I'm not doing each of these ideas the full explication it deserves in the interest of time, but I'm just trying to list them to show all the potential possibilities. And Gilbert and Gubar then go on to detail how white was in the 19th century, a distinctively female color, frequently chosen as emblematic by or of women, 
for reasons Dickinson seems to have understood quite well, and they devote the next few pages to unpacking the white dress. I realize that this whole talk might open more questions than it does offer answers, and I don't claim to be a scholar or expert on Dickinson at all, just somebody who wants to bring you know, competing ideas uh, to the public here. Um, they say that the best artists don't write about or depict what they know, but show you uh, their struggle to understand something. Um, Paul Salon, I think it was, right, said he was trying to write uh, ambiguity without masks, and he was saying that if the artist you know, presents some self-constructed ambiguity to the reader or viewer or listener, right, and the, the joy of the art is to figure out what the artist meant, that that's falling short of the more noble goals of art. The real noble goal is to present to the viewer or reader or listener an ambiguity that actually exists in the real world and have them confront that and you know, kind of subcontract the work to them to try to figure that out, right? Crowdsource it to all of us to like solve the world's problems, right? And I think that's what Emily Dickinson's poems are doing and that's why their popularity and relevance has endured to this day. Um, so at this point, I would like to make it more of sort of a conversational thing um, and not even asking me questions, but just if anybody wants to sort of share any feelings, you know, in the interest of National Poetry Month, you know, uh, about Dickinson, now's the time to do so. How long did it take for her to be, I mean, were her poems recognized while she was still alive, or was that only posthumous? She had sent some to an editor. And this is what I was trying to um, get to with the gentleman in the front's question. She had sent some to an editor and they were like heavily, heavily, heavily edited, or you might even say redacted. And they, she had a few published in her lifetime, but they weren't the way that she had originally written them. And it's only after her death and you know, going through her papers we could compare, I say we as if I'm some kind of scholar, right? That scholars could compare the ones that were published with what she had written you know, in her manuscripts or what she had sent in her letters. So she did have a few published in her lifetime, but they're not the way that we know and love them now, right? Her, her idiosyncratic use of verse and use of punctuation was dampened, right, or diluted to more sort of fit the desire of the day. And no one at that time was writing with the ellipses. No, and nobody has since. No Right. Yeah. yeah. Someone, someone had said of Whitman, and I think you can fairly apply the same thing to Dickinson, that you know, since Whitman or Dickinson, everyone has been trying to imitate or consciously avoid so as not to be accused of imitating. Right? Like that's how monolithic and monumental their works were. Yeah. What do you think her goal was in writing and not to have other people read <clears throat> Therapy? You know, therapy, you know, just uh, it's a way of figuring out the things that you don't understand or attempting to figure out the things you don't understand. Um, which is it? I can't tell. It's either that book Nickel and Dime, right, about, you know, working, um, or there's another one about like the working poor. But either one of those, it says like you can't take, and it gets kind of Marxist a little bit, it's like you can't take your frustration with the fact that you work really hard but make less than a minimum wage out on your boss, so you misdirect that to your children or your spouse or something like that. So, I mean, she couldn't take out her various frustrations with A, the struggle of being a woman, or B, the struggle of being a poet, or C, the struggle of just being a person who wasn't understand, understood rather, uh, in the world into which she was born, right? She can't do anything with that other than write these poems. That's kind of been my take on it. But again, I don't want to claim to be an authority. The poems of hers that have changed your life or really you keep in your heart when you're doing things? No, I just talked about women, so I wanted to see if talking about Dickinson would get a lot of people out. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. <laughs> trying to get people in the Athenaeum, you know? She's a heavy hitter. I mean, I don't, I mean, have they changed my life? I mean, they've changed the lives of people that I've read, right? I mean, every, I mean, if she's the mother of American poetry, right? Walt Whitman's the father of American poetry. They were the first two people to sort of come out of nowhere and do their own thing in their own voice. Yeah, everything prior to that was an imitation of like British forms or more archaic stuff, yeah. So, I don't have a super personal relationship with Emily Dickinson, I'm sorry to admit. I'll openly admit that, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. I'm documenting my my truthfulness for posterity. Yeah. Um, are, are the poems still being analyzed by? I'm sorry, Susan. Gilbert and Gubar. Yeah. So so that is like the groundbreaking work of feminist literary criticism from 1979, and the book was reissued 
20 or 30 years later with a new forward. The one you have downstairs is, I think, the original edition. Um, I mean, well, the reason I wanted to pair the landmark original work of Gilbert and Gubar with the new work of Kornfeld is to show that people are still thinking about and commenting on Dickinson in new ways. And I mean, I think that's a heck of a project, right? It's 1,789 poems and you're gonna commit to reading and commenting publicly on all of them? That itself is, is a lifetime work right there. And how long is she doing that? Because I think the last publisher that I could see was sometime in February. Yeah. Well, she, if you, if you read her bio, which I did because I was just so curious, she, she calls herself a gardener, a professional gardener. She's not a, a scholar of literature. Um, but then, of course, we know Dickinson wrote all kinds of poems about you know, little creatures in the garden and about flowers. So that was, pr I mean, I don't want to suppose we could email her and ask, but, or maybe she'll see it, but um, this talk, that is. Um, but I guess that would have been, I presume that would have been her entry, her entry into Dickinson. Um, but I mean, I think it's, it's such an ambitious project and, you know, I wanted to sort of make people more aware of it, you know. It's kind of almost, maybe it's um, diminishing in importance to compare it to one of those, you know, page a day calendars with like the far side comic on every day that you pull one off, right, or the joke a day. But like that's what she's doing, right, is she's, you know, trying to give you something that you can refer to, right, on a daily basis if you want. That yep. Being a blogger, yep. Yeah, if you just search the prowling bee, you can find it. Yeah, and I've, I've used um, a lot of her critiques uh, in class to help sort of illuminate Dickinson's aims or the, the historical context around a given Dickinson poem for students because, um, and I kind of uh, tried to reference it or extract a little bit of it here in this talk. I mean, Kornfeld both gives her own opinion but gives us a little bit of that context. You know, for example, it, was, it wasn't my detective work, it was Kornfeld that said, you know, Whistler painted a painting called The White Girl and the novel The Woman in White was serialized around the time that Dickinson wrote, you know, her poem. So Dickinson could have been getting these ideas from stuff that was, that was in the public consciousness. So I think Kornfeld's valuable for that reason, that she, she's giving us both her thoughts and she's doing a little bit of scholarly work, despite, by her own admission, being merely a gardener. said they weren't excruciating. No, no, um, no. I think I'm trying to say um, that there's such a gulf between the actual writing of the thing and the literary critics who come along later and make a job out of reading and writing those things. Absolutely. And teaching them. And teaching them Absolutely. In colleges um, and high school. Uh, uh, and I... And poetry is such, especially, is so, so um, uh, I don't know, so vivid. Um, the color, I mean, it goes right down to like the place where dreams come from and the place where, you know, the deepest experience uh, of being human comes from. And, um, and, in these, and in these poems, except for the mouse one, uh, the other two, there's, there's, there's um, I think that we're seeing language pointing to an, an extraordinary fire of being. 
I, I don't think anyone would refute that. I think I could just sort of, I thought I could just skip over that because that was all generally accepted. And I share your skepticism and belief that people are given, you know, master's degrees and PhDs for offering tenuously supported uh, pieces of critique. And I, I agree with you that, you know, the work of scholars ultimately fails to capture the mysticism of poetry. But again, I mean, Emily Dickinson, the mystic has been treated already. That's, that's been, you know, exhaustively sort of uh, written about, you know. Well, then can I ask this? Go ahead. What, what, um, what is the feminist perspective here? I, I don't know if I'm getting it. Right, well, I, I mean, the, the whole time I've been giving this, I felt a little silly. And again, I'll say this right to the camera. I'll break the wall a little bit here. I mean, you know, I'm a 31-year-old American dude, you know, like I'm not, I feel kind of strange talking about the femininity or the, the feminist dilemma of the, the, you know, you know, the mother of American poetry's works. The feminist perspective, the original one, is Gilbert and Gubars. I'm sure there are younger women who are in graduate school and writing work since 1979 that would seek to challenge Gilbert and Gubar. But since, you know, I'm speaking to, you know, a, a, or a presumed general audience, I don't know who's going to show up. I don't know what sort of level to engage in material, I was going to say, hey, let me, let me take the first work, which is Mad Woman in the Attic, which right there, I mean, that title itself is sort of fraught with the psychological paralysis of like, does, does that help the position of women, you know? Um, and the fact that they call, um, you know, they subtitle, um, you know, the chapter that Dickinson shows up in, Strength and Agony, right? I mean, this, this is some yellow wallpaper level stuff, right? It's, it's not really, you know, it's, it's just portraying women as continually sort of trapped. I, I mean, I'm hesitant to sort of, you know, weigh in myself on it because that is not at all my area of scholarship. I just thought I could sort of bring in two critical opinions and get away with it, but thanks for challenging me. Do you have a feeling about the feminine perspective of this? Do you have a feeling? How you would relate to it? I do not. Um, I read an Emily Dickinson poem every day, <laughs> and I do not uh, find anything remotely. Her feminism came out, I think, I think, when she was much younger, and her she refused to kneel down when, when the priest or whoever it was, the minister came into the. Uh, I mean, it wasn't wasn't her family all? They were the men of the family were all important in their church. And the pastor, the, was it, I don't know, it was the pastor or, or um, they, who came to, their, to the uh, Dickinson house and, and it was that time of this great spiritual renewals going on in New England, right? Mm -hmm. and, and said everyone kneel down, not people that would put it that way. And she would not kneel down. Mm -hmm. and, and there's so much in this whole thing about her God the God things in her poems. I mean, to me, they are they are simply that that essence of divine, and nothing at all to do with with um, the patriarchal God, you know, right. and the Father God, and, and right. all that you know, the Father stuff that's in there is really I, I agree with that as her own. Father. Right. Well, when somebody wrote eighteen hundred poems, there's lots of room to find different yeah. readings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in the preface to that book, The Mad Woman in the Attic, which again is about Austin, Shelley, Eliot, Dickinson, they say that the personal was the political, the sexual was the textual. And I think what they mean there is that these things are in, you know, they're, they're intertwined. They can't be sort of teased out or separated, right? I guess, I, I guess I'm really um, responding from a place that I was in graduate school when that sort of thing was being written. Mm -hmm. It's part of my training too, and um, that uh, um, I really, I really would have thought that we that the fem that was such an angry time, you know, and that well, I was the, born, and that the fe <laughs> and that the feminists now, a feminist look now at Dickinson would be very, very, very. Uh, I maybe next April I'll bring that one in. I'll do some reading. You know, I wanted to go with the original monolithic one, you know, like, go with the first one. Yeah. yeah. Bravo. 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 Thank you. Why? Thank you for, because, because I got as far on the brochure 
as Emily Dickinson, and I knew I wanted to come to hear about Emily Dickinson. Yeah. And to hear about, uh, and, and then I saw, well, there were a couple of people who blogged about her. Well, I didn't go any further, I didn't research that. But to, to essentially ignore the poetry here tonight. Uh, well, that, it's, that's what, I, you know. You well, we're not ignoring the poetry, it's right there. We're presuming everyone's already read the poetry and we can go to the next layer of like critical analysis and sort of talk about what it might mean. If you want me to just read poems and then. That's a great idea. <laughs> okay. Before you move on to. Well, I was going to go to the shelves, I was going to go to the oh, stacks. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, chronological question. Yeah, yeah, of course. Women, women of the, the 19th century. Yep. Uh, what era, how does she fit in with the Bronte as far as, the Bronte sisters as far as the time, the exact time in the 19th century? I don't want to like dodge your question, but I wonder if it's apples and oranges because it's America and it's um, England. True. Yeah, um, who was it? De Tocqueville? I'm just thinking yeah. of the, the struggle for these, the women, where they, they both use writing as an expression. Sure. Um, Um, Absolutely. I was just curious, and having just seen the PBS special on the Bronte sisters, it brought up some. Uh, I was just curious about. What the yeah, um, I mean, I would go to Wuthering Heights if I may, because that's a book I know well. I mean, that book, right? Okay, so Wuthering, it's on the moors, it's misty, everything's obscured, right? The house itself is like falling into. You know what time when it was written? What year? Oh gosh, I've read so many and books by now. When she, when Emily we could Google it. I was going to do it on and the, on the big screen. And then the brother, the Bronte's brother, he was a, a struggling poet. Yeah. And uh, he, he, he was the one that told his sisters that the money is in the novel. Yeah, so the Bronte's predate yeah. Dickinson. So that's when they but could we call 20 years difference fairly years contemporary? Yeah. yeah. Just thinking of women's position in that period. Yeah, and yeah. And how they were able to express themselves and liberate themselves. It compared to can I say to something as well about yes. that? You can answer that question, go ahead. I'm not answering any question, only that you have helped me clarify what was disturbing me about uh, something here, um, which is the idea, I mean, there's no question about the Brontes and their rage against the system, but that is not the case, I don't think, with them. Yes. She, she, she didn't kneel down, she wanted a a life as a spirit that was going to be hers. You know, that's really what she and, was trying to. And that's the true of men and women. That is not a feminist thing. Right. That is a human thing. And um, and and, and I, uh, I'm just going to diverge a little bit to say I know a lot about dreams, and I used to teach dreams workshops in the wellness program at UVM. And the color white is simply, um, it's, and one of the ways I think she, in fact, expresses it, whiteness, is not in a politically way, political way, but as the culmination of all things, the highest of all things, the divinity that, anyway, and, and, that, and that that mystery to her, and to me that is not a you know, that it's really is a spirituality. More of a human spirituality. Yes. Uh, so I don't know if I agree with that, but that's... So I guess that's why I found those, you know, those ladies of my, my age period <laughs> were uh, a little bit out of date there. But I also think that these poems could not have been written by a man. Oh, I see. So in that totally. way, we look at them through, this, through totally. the lens of feminist <laughs> literature. These are women's poems. These are poems that are written by women. Now, so Whitman's poems could only be written by him. Well, most of them. There's some that could be either. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, well, we don't know what he thought of himself. I right. Guess. That's true. Because because both of, by the end. right and both of these both of these writers and I think one of the reasons they endure is that you know Walt Whitman the man and Walt Whitman the voice and leaves of grass are two totally different things, okay. right? I mean, Walt Whitman the man was like a, he loved attention. He was a shameless self promoter. He was pretty confident in himself, right? He was wearing tailored custom suits, you know. 
Right, right. But then Whitman, the voice in the book, is so anxious and so insecure and dressed like a carpenter and portrays himself as working class. And that's why America has latched onto it and loves that, that book. But to go back to um, the Brontes, I would, I would point to Wuthering Heights because that's a book I know well, right? So I'm going to you know, speak on something I can speak knowledgeably about. That book, to me, is interesting because it's a really potent metaphor of all the mists and there's people getting lost out there on the moors and there's the shadowy figure in the window and you know it's a metaphorical or figurative <coughs> landscape where one can choose to hide in the mist or is involuntarily obscured by it but it's also an actual literal physical landscape <coughs> in England so that has always been interesting to me and I mean that's certainly I mean I don't is it safe to call it a feminist book it's certainly you know a feminine book. I don't know if it's a feminist book. I don't want to stand up here and claim things are feminist or not. But there's also that book, Housekeeping, by Marilyn Robinson. Do people know this book? I mean, I'm increasingly convinced like that's not just the best book in American literature. That's one of the best books ever. And that book, Housekeeping, Housekeeping by Marilyn Robinson. Robinson. Yeah. I mean, there's the, there's a really potent metaphor of the water and the lake there, and as as a sort of repository for our memories and our anxieties and our problems. You know. Um, and again, I would, I'm hesitant to call that a feminist book, but again, it's certainly a feminine book. All the principal characters are women. There's a conspicuous absence, absence of men in that book. Um, housekeeping, great book. I'm telling people to read it all the time. Yeah. It's a lot of poetry. Yeah. Well, I don't think you're going to read poetry, I was hoping to talk about critical opinions. <laughs> Um, I love hearing Brady talk. This is two out of the three have, have brought this kind of discussion forward in the Q&A. And I will say often, um, whether it's first Wednesday talks, other things we have here, often you're kind of spellbound by the unchallengeable knowledge of the speaker and you kind of get thrown back in your seat to say, oh yeah, yeah, command performance. And rarely do you hear <clears throat> anyone challenge the speaker either because they have the same depth of knowledge or um, a, a passion for the subject which overwhelms their ability to be quiet. Uh, I will say the last time we had somebody speaking here on, this, on the first Wednesday topic, it was about <clears throat> medieval Europe and a man came to the speaker this time either during the talk or right after the same person came to a speaker a year ago and said, I would ask you to please not use the term counter-reformation. And this man was particularly hot on this notion of that term. So he addressed two scholars who used this term, and I, I'm, I'm not knowledgeable enough to, to do what he did. He spoke German and, and other things. And he was very knowledgeable, but he challenged the speakers by saying, you're wrong to use that term. And I felt, uh, these are competent people, they don't need my defense, they can ad uh, adequately defend themselves. And both said something on the order of, um, this is an accepted scholarly term, it's okay for me to say this. And this man was incensed that, I think twice in this floor, he had heard this term about which he disagreed. Um, my point is, he was one of the few people I've heard actually address or challenge a speaker. And uh, long story short, I actually like an engaged audience that, because I will learn, I learn more from you oh, yeah. and more from everybody who's here than I will just being blown away by a speaker who's making my head spin because they're so good in terms of presentation and everything else that I'm not um, dissing your presentation. No, I, I love an active engagement because I'll walk away having learned more, so. Does it feel like a, a seminar? Yes. Yeah, yes. right, when there's good pushback and, and you feel yeah. like you're in it. And, and as Brandon has said, it, he said in an email to me that um, there's a poet who speaks here who Brandon had as a, an instructor years ago. And he said something on the order, I won't paraphrase it right now. No, it's okay. I, um, <laughs> I think back and, and um, how strongly I defended my opinion to her class. And I thought, good for you. Which man. I'm embarrassed about now. But you were engaged, and, and this is a person who is like all the way there in terms of intellectual capacity and history and her father was a scholar and yet good for you. Yeah, well I I meant I talk more than listen. You know. Well you probably try to revise that. So, and yeah. everybody learn more, especially for we people who are more in the 
they hang back in the class and take good notes. Could I ask a question? This is a pertinent question because I probably know less about Dickinson's poetry than anybody in the room. I'm going to ask you more poetry in general. Sure. Why, if White is, as you said, the, uh, the epitome of heaven on this, why did she choose to drop light into the purple well? What is, what is, does purple have other uh, contexts that I'm not understanding as opposed to any other context? The, the one that leaps most quickly to my mind is, you know, in ancient Rome it was a symbol of royalty because you had to crush up a bunch of snails to get it. So it was labor intensive and expensive. So purple has always been associated with royalty. And I think, I mean, I grew up Catholic, right? So they wear a purple sort of stole sometimes, right? Depending on what time of year it is. So purple's always been the, the color of royalty. Yeah. And then, you know, as Gilbert and Gubar do in their book, they list a whole bunch of different things white could be interpreted as. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they do go into detail on each one of those. I've just, you know, given the, the sort of main point, and, you know, for, for sake of time, I didn't want to go into it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, perhaps the, the I, I don't want to say it eclipses Dickinson because it depends on one's level of passion, but I mean, Moby Dick is kind of like the preeminent big white thing in American literature, right? That's what sort of is in the forefront of our consciousness. And even within Melville scholarship, people have debated what the whiteness there means, right? Is it evil or is Moby Dick himself not evil? It's, you know, Ahab that views him as evil and views him as this oppositional force, you know? Or is... Moby Dick the whale just in a heavenly kind of way and only, you know, doling out the punishment Ahab deserves for his own sort of short-sightedness. Maybe I'll give a talk on Moby Dick next time, right? Yeah, right? So, I mean, so within Dickinson, what the white means is, you know, hotly debated, and within Melville scholarship, what the white means is hotly debated, right? What I was just trying to do is, you know, toss out all the different potential options. I don't subscribe to anyone. I'm not espousing or defending anyone. Painting in the gallery, girl reading. Mm -hmm. She is in all white. She's in all white. And there's a lily in, on the windowsill, and that painting seems to be fraught with all of the the uses of white as purity yes. and divine divinity, something like that. Yes. There's the white lily, and the arc of her hand um, sort of captures the arc of the lily. And yet, it, in that case, there seems to be one way to read that painting. At least that's how I read it. But other people have said things to me about those paintings that have made me see them completely different. But I think in that case, you're getting just one, one sort of narrow version of, and knowing what Horace Fairbanks seemed to, how he seemed to be collecting here, I think, again, you read that painting partly by looking at every other painting of a woman in that yeah. collection to say, he was painting, presenting one vision of womanhood, and this happened to be a particularly apt version of something he was trying to say. But. And that thing that you mentioned where people have, you know, had ideas about what that painting means that are completely a surprise to you. I mean, that's the joy of having these talks and teaching and being in class. And that's why I do what I do is because, you know, students or, you know, peers come up with ideas that would have never occurred to me, yet I can completely see the justification for it in the text or the painting. Do, right. do you read Emily Dickinson? Occasionally. We had Huck Gutman, some of you will know who he is, he's a UVM professor, and he was talking, he was talking about Dickinson, it was when you gave, the same year you gave your Whitman talk. Sure, they were, they were adjacent <coughs> months, yeah. And the room was rearranged, so literally Huck Gutman was standing right there, and he was, many of these poems are in his head, and he would deliver them, and he would say, oh, and he would be emotive, and he would say, I don't know what that line means. Mm -hmm. and he, he gave a very different kind of inhabited talk about Emily Dickinson, in which, I have to say, I was pretty mesmerized and didn't have a single thought running through my head other than like admiration. Mm -hmm. And yet, that in that talk, you were sort of like thrown into the Dickinson pool. And you were there, and there was this man before you saying you know, these, these profound things and, and admitting like, I don't know what this line means, and I've been teaching this for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And again, I learned a lot from him because he said, I don't know what this means. And critics say this, and critics say that. I don't know what this means to me. So mm -hmm. I, I remember being fascinated by him and wanted, he also talks about Whitman, and I thought one of these days we'll ask um, him do Whitman, and you'll, you'll do the next week's lecture on something. something you want to do 
like a dueling, dueling presenters. I, I love the yeah. difference in your styles. And um, I re what I remember most about that talk is when he said, I don't know what this means. Who this was a man who was as smart as they come. Who was that? Huck Gutman, G-U-T-M-A-N, M-A-N. He is a, I think he's at <coughs> UVM now. And he also he does a thing. He was part of the Yes. And you can, um, you can probably find him online, and if you subscribe to his very occasional, I'm going to send you a poem and an explication of it, these things show up magically in your email every three months out of nowhere. And it's not regular. It's like one day there's a Huck Gutman poem in your inbox. And it's not his poem. He's, he's talking about some poem. And always fascinating, but he is a person who gives great talks about Emily Dickinson and a lot of people in that period. Yeah, are you um, dissatisfied or aghast that I don't have a deep personal connection with Emily Dickinson? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, I think you might be a little too young. <laughs> that is potentially true. I mean, when I spoke about Levis, I said there's poems that I feel like I'm just getting, right? Because I've made some mistakes in life, right? Or had bad things happen to me. Are you the one who recommended Levis to you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That That's a fabulous poet. Yeah. Sure. If Bob recommends it to me, I mean, And I just said, really. I got it off of Randy. Yeah, yeah. It's on yeah. right. and I, I had never heard of this man. And this talk, and unfortunately, in the poster, it said, a poet's poet. And we had a smaller gathering than this. Because I think that scared everybody away. Like, oh, no, I'm not struggling with Wallace Stevens or somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's completely accessible. What, what they all need, I don't know. The, the language is completely accessible in, in a way that this is often impenetrable to me. I often am trying to uh, look up what did somebody say this means because often I, I, I don't know. I don't know what they mean. So the words are very plain, but I don't know what any of this means often. Yeah, I mean, there's probably, sorry about there's probably thousands, I mean, I think it's a safe bet to say there are thousands of reading, readings of Dickinson. I thought I'd be performing a public service if I brought two in. And then yeah, even then you're going to be like, and then you're going to have the Huck Gutman who says, I don't know what this means. Like, I've been at this a long time and I'm clueless. So he's, he's got notions, but he's sometimes like, I am not sure. So. But uh, maybe, maybe coming to the depth of the mystery is the, the journey that we have to take. Yeah, and I think he was perfectly content to say, yes. I'm good right here. Going upstream, this is going by me. I kind of missed the whole thing. I think fine. Because some of it means it, it maybe is impenetrable to me as a person, or it has mixed meanings. I assume every single poem she wrote had a very fixed meaning. Fixed meaning? On the other hand, maybe <laughs> she wrote them to let you interpret as you like. Right. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know, obviously. What do you mean by fixed? To her, there was intentional mystery, perhaps, but what is there didn't need interpretation from her. She could have said, I'll tell you exactly what this is. And I, I don't know that, but I'm thinking every poet does things completely intentionally, precisely, and, and sometimes there is like, I'm, I'm laying out the mystery for you as I see this mystery, and maybe you're going to see the mystery differently. But I'm doing this completely intentionally, not by accident, not by second-rate choice, by, you know, by accuracy, and yet sometimes it remains completely obtuse. At least but, yeah, but isn't there a third way besides, if, or I don't know, that contains those two possibilities, uh, which is, which is being intuitive, you know? It, it, I don't think a poet necessarily knows where some of this comes from. Um, no, I even agree. though it's quite intentional, yeah. as you put it, to write, to write, you mm -hmm. want to get at something, you're trying to get at something. I would argue that mm -hmm. the idea that the artist is in complete control of what they're doing at all times is a misnomer, right? For sure, they're a masterful creator or a masterful craftsperson at what they do. and. The majority of the time they're uh, in control, but 
all the best songs or paintings or films or poems. There's a moment where the person is sort of pushing the boundary or the frontier, right? And there's a moment in every song or poem where it's at total risk of coming apart or spinning out of control, and it's because they're trying to do something new in that moment. And I've always, that's, that's the belief I've always subscribed to. Right, so that would, I'm trying to harmonize or make a sort of symbiosis. Here. It's interesting to me, again, this is a totally uninterested opinion. Let's hear it. Interesting to see what you, or I, the title of your talk, I'm going to take this in the 21st century. Now I understand yeah. you're talking about a 21st century interpretation of Correction. that. But she, what we're experiencing now is what she was experiencing in her life. The world was changing like crazy. Yeah. Absolutely. So you're not un you're not uneducated. Well, I mean, well, just don't. No. But anyway, no, no. But anyway the, so it's amazing to me. I should just see whatever security she felt in the old ways was disappearing. She had no control. Yeah. No, whether the Northern any of us had control over the internet or you know or any of these things. You know, you're just sort of with it. But they were the same thing: the sewing machine, the railroad, all these things. Absolutely. And, and, and she stayed out there a little farm there in Amherst, which is wonderful to, to visit. There. You know, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so it struck me that she was, in addition to being female, she was also, all these things were changing in a masculine, because of masculine input. You know, all these things that I just mentioned were mostly masculine input in the Civil War, of course. Right. So are you, are you saying she felt like she wasn't a participant? Yeah, she just felt like she was trying to survive and changing. Yeah, and, and I said earlier that I think the reason Whitman and Dickinson endure beyond the merit of their you know individual texts, right, which those alone would would um, you know justify their endurance, but they had these idiosyncratic voices that came out of nowhere and these simultaneously self confident and insecure voices, and America has loved that ever since. But also, and this is what you brought up. I've said before about Whitman, but it's certainly true of Dickinson as well, that they saw an incredible amount of change in their lifetime, right? So that right there is just an interesting sort of time capsule of American history. In Whitman's poem, Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, there's ships with sails and there's ships with smokestacks, you know? That's a transitional moment. Emerson and Thoreau doing, looking into what is the meaning of things? Is all this stuff important or should we have to look beyond that? Transcendence somehow. Right, I mean, every big te wave of technological newness, there's a corresponding reaction against it and a desire to sort of return to a simpler time or a simpler mode of living, right? I mean, heck, I moved from New Jersey slash New York City up here for that exact reason, right? Like, so, uh, we're not meant to sit in traffic. So, I came around from Mount Morris to Albertville, Florida. Oh, I lived in Chester. Yeah. yeah. My brother still lives down in Somerville and stuff. Yeah, yeah. New Jersey's a good place to be from. <laughs> well, people tell me I'm out of Vermonter because I wasn't born here. I say I bought land in the kingdom. I think that counts for something. Oh, so yeah, very separate. You say I'm not a Vermonter, but I got here as soon as I could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so good. Other questions, comments? Well, very good. Well, when we think about interpreting something, and pr probably this illustration is familiar to all of you, but. I offer it about the, the ballet performance and when someone said, what did it mean? And the person said, I spent 25 years developing this and you asked me, what did it mean? Mm -hmm. That's the way you certainly have uh, stimulated us and yeah. at least me to do further research and reading in, uh, with Emily's poems. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's all I hope for. Again, these are two two opinions that are not my own that I just thought I'd bring in. So if your reaction is to want to go out and then that's, I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm almost embarrassed for you with the small appearance. Usually it's much bigger. I no wonder if it just made people scared of, of admitting their ignorance, which I'm never afraid of admitting. It's well, maybe but it's a nice one. Is that where if it's lit or whatever, or, 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 or it's, I'm usually, it's not a surprise. It's not a better thing. It's, yeah. it's rain, it's there's it's no rain. I'm not taking it too personally. And we are the lucky beneficiaries. So. Yes. Like
Could I ask you to go back to the first poem? Absolutely. Since I can't find it. Yep. No romance. So yeah, if, if it doesn't show up in uh, that collected edition you have there, I mean, it, it certainly exists on, on the internet. Um, Bartleby, have you, have you heard of this website? No. Bartleby, so it's like Bartleby the Scrivener, right? Yes. So Bartleby.com, it's a collection of works of literature that are now in the public domain. So it's an online library. And the next one also? Please. Sure, sure. Bartleby, I said I'd rather not. And yeah. I prefer not. I prefer not. Yeah, nonviolent resistance, eh? Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. I guess I just don't want to leave without acknowledging uh, how much value this conversation has had for me, personally. But also, I want to acknowledge something else about Emily Dickinson. Um, and I think it, this is the most valuable way i found to think about her. And it really comes from reading um, Stephanie Jung for many, many, many years. Um, Jung came, Carl Jung was, was uh, the seventh generation, he came from seven generations of Parsons. And here was this young boy born into what the most conservative Swiss uh, context imaginable. And he saw visions. He didn't belong. He didn't belong, and and that whole con that whole crisis of being for him led to the great uh, uh, union knowledge that we have because of his exploration of that. I have come to regard Emily Dickinson mm -hmm. as being born into this lawyerly, rigid, conservative context, and as this ferocious spirit. And if she had, you know, she could have just become mentally ill. That's why I hate the title. I hate that title, Mad Woman in the Attic. And not as, not as your, it's not your title. But um, because she was no mad woman. She, she, she leapt into who she really is, you know, was. And, um, and these are the poems that came out of it. And some of them are really stupid, I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> not, not have nothing in them um, except a bad mood or a mood or, or something, you know. And some of them are the greatest of the great. Yeah. Anyway, so that's what I, uh, what I, I see her as in react. Just this person who didn't fit where she was born, and so often that's true of artists, isn't it? Yes. Signing you up for the next lecture. <laughs> <laughs>